All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about the art and science of complex sales, and I am here with my friend Warwick, Warwick Brown. I'm really pleased to have you on the show. Warwick is a key account management specialist, and so thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. I'm delighted to be here and really excited to dig into the much misunderstood topic of key account management and account growth and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I think uh, right now we're in a world where key account growth and key account management is is massively important and it's getting a lot of uh, play in the world of sales and companies. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, account retention is is what drives business. You know, it's all great to win accounts, but, you know, we need to keep them. That's where the money comes in. And I think, you know, people are recognizing that acquisition is expensive and retention is much cheaper. And it's what can really become the growth engine of the business. Now, key account management has been around forever. I mean, since the 60s, you know, it's not a new concept, but I think as we you know, look to grow our business and we look to protect the business that we have, it's getting more in focus. At least I hope so. Yeah. Well, well, tell me about that. Like I I normally ask in this, like, help me define sales and how does that, does it work to you? Well, we're going to get to that question, but, but first off, let's, let's start with how do you define, how do you define key account management? Tell me a little bit about that. When I explain it to my clients, I always say my role as a key account manager is to optimize our partnership to make sure that you get the best value from partnering with us. And that's the way I like to see it. I always like to think that, you know, the customer is front and center. My number one job is to make sure that the table stakes are sorted, that they get what they paid for. And then beyond that, I'm looking for new opportunities for me to help them focus on problem areas they haven't really looked at, or for me to give them new insights that's going to help them drive better business outcomes. But through that, they're going to use obviously my products, my services, to make that happen. You know, so the goal is for me to find the problems that need solving and then to connect that with the solutions I have that can, you know, help them uh, address them. Rather than saying, here's the stuff I need to sell, where who's going to buy it, what can I figure out where this fits in. You, know, you kind of reverse engineer the problem to your solutions. So that's the way I like to think of key account management, but essentially it's around account growth and retention. You know, making customers more profitable, keeping them happy enough that they stick around for a long time. I just read a really cool piece and it's uh, Jocko Vanderkool wrote it, but he, he's calling, he, he talks about, and this is specifically about SaaS. He called it the sweet spot in the eye of the storm. And he's talking about, we're on the brink and you're seeing it right now of the economic downturn and economic issues. And he's talking, he's speaking to SaaS, but he, he thinks the, the major, major, major thing that SaaS companies have been missing and companies in general have been missing is they've been focusing on recurring revenue and not recurring impact. And how he defines recurring impact is recurring impact measurable with the customer that you're doing, you know, everything that you said that you're going to do and more as a company. How, how does that tie into uh, key account management? Yeah, similar principle. You're looking at not only just keeping the customer at status quo. You're looking at challenging them. You're looking at helping them grow. You're looking at, and and, and looking at how they can help you grow. You know, ultimately it should be around mutual value, not just one way value. You know, you, you lift your customer up, but you know, they have to stand on your shoulders to get there. You know, you should be uh, partnering with them. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's pretty aligned. How do you measure that? What are some of the things that you go into a company and I mean, is it is it the same every time when you're working with companies or is, are there different elements? How do you measure? The, typically, there's five things that customers are interested in. I focus on these five. I think cost reduction, so spending mm-hmm. less, cost avoidance, so being able to do the same, but spending less money, making money, so helping them grow revenue. And then usually it's around quality, you know, and efficiency. So there's the five things that are quite quantifiable. You can usually measure those and ultimately they all have some bottom line impact and you can effectively incorporate a range of strategies, tactics into your account plans and you can link that up with your solutions. And if you did nothing but focus on those five things, you would have a successful account plan that you could measure year in, year out in terms of you know, growth results, year on year performance, quarter on quarter performance. So I'd start there. I mean, you know, beyond that, there's lots more things you could look at, but 
the kind of table stakes. Is there any of those five that you're seeing today in market that people are like, oh, that is, you know, where I need to focus, or is it is it uh, a mix? I think it depends, right? You've got your your, your SVPs and your, your C suite and all your executives that really want to focus on cost reduction and cost avoidance, but the people in the trenches really want to focus on efficiency and quality. So it's that push pull, you know, uh, people wanting to see bottom line reforms, but ultimately user experience, quality of the experience, less hassles, integration, connectivity, you know, all that kind of stuff really plays an important role. So I think the challenge for a lot of key account managers and their counterparts within their customer organization is how do they bring attention to the value of all those things that maybe don't look immediately like they have some bottom line, you know, you can attach numbers to them too, but ultimately there is some value in those. And yeah, so it's not one thing, but I think if you can find a balance, if you can find something that pleases the executives and show that you're controlling or containing costs, and then you've got room to play with some of the the softer things like efficiency and quality and other things that are important to stakeholders. Yeah. I haven't been, haven't been both, you know, Executive and then the performer, it, it's it's a very and the account manager that's and that's trying to drive revenue, right? There's a there's that dichotomy, and it always felt like it shouldn't be there, but it always is. There's just the reality of sometimes there's so much, there's only so much to go around. And at this point in time, what I've seen, and tell me if you're seeing this as well, but what I'm seeing is a lot of the smart money, a lot of the the, the strong executives, they're looking at the cost cutting side, but they are saying, okay, it's, it is time to double down on things like, it's time to double down on things like training. It's time to double down on things like differentiation by through people, because those are the things that are making wildly happy customers, right? I'm seeing this, especially in areas, a, a small to medium business, right? That is, mm-hmm. that's competing. There's a, there's a large competitive scope and it's not just about an employee as a number, but it's, it's how do I differentiate that person? How do I uh, double down on making them better so I can, uh, and getting them in the right spot? Are you seeing the same thing or am I there <clears throat> in terms of how they're looking to look at those resources? Yeah, I think there's definitely investments being made in staff development and, um, you know, training and coaching and things like that. That's certainly a big part of my business. It's one of, one of the practice lines that I have. Uh, a lot of the space that I work in, I see mid-sized business startups or even functions within larger companies, but, you know, the account management function might be smaller. And they're going from this agile state where, this, you know, they hire a few bodies. They're like, you're an account manager and they're very responsive. They do whatever it takes to keep customers happy. But the more customers they win and the more account managers that come on board, they realize, actually, you know what? We need systems. We need processes. We need tools. We need frameworks. We need governance because otherwise it's a free-for-all and there's no consistency of experience. And then when somebody comes new or when somebody leaves, it's chaos and nobody really knows what's going on. So you have to sacrifice some agility in order to get leverage and scalability. And that's where I'm finding a vast number of companies are at right now. And that's where a lot of them reach out to me is to say, help us, you know, help us corral the beast and bring some mm-hmm. of the stuff that we're doing together and try and deploy some consistency and some framework so that people do the same thing. And um, we have some control over what's being, you know, how we work with our clients. So I think there's an element of that. I don't think there's enough investment in processes, systems, tools, and frameworks and uh, documenting all of that. I think a lot of times people think, hey, let's just hire bodies. Hey, we're just given an account manager. Let's just get somebody on board and they'll figure it out. But unless you have all of that stuff underneath, they, they often flounder, you know? So I'd like to see more in that space for sure. So the, the chicken or the egg, what 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 do you recommend comes first? Like I I know where I sit on this, but how are you working with with companies in that area? When when you're looking at systems, they have a bunch of people. How are you going about driving process through the organization and driving, especially through key account management, which is historically a lot for uh, and I'm, my question is just keep going on, but historically for a long time, how I see it is right. You, you get a lot of key account managers that, you know, they believe, they believe it's solely relationship based. And while it's, while it's critical to have that relationship and you, it's, that's table stakes, right? So how do you help them drive process and repeatability and that type of stuff through account management? I mean, it's a 
a loaded question. There's so many elements. It's it, a loaded I, question. I think, I'm sorry. I think you're right. I mean, definitely relationship is a big, you know, that's foundational, right? If you don't have the right relationships in place with the right people and the sentiment is good, you know, they value what you do and you can get a meeting with them to talk about stuff and get decisions made, well, nothing will happen. So relationships are at the core of key account management. But I think where, where the challenge is, is that organizations think you own the relationship. The buck stops with you. If there is a problem, throw it at the key account manager. You know, they're, they're like the messenger. They're the ones that are front of house. Like, you know, the, the chef might be falling behind in the kitchen, but they're the ones that have to take the heat. You know, the chef doesn't hear the customer screaming that their plate's 45 minutes late or their meal's cold. The server does. And that's where the key account manager often sits. They're the ones facing on the front line the, the challenges with the client. So because of that, Key account managers are the ones that are facing that angry customer all the time. They're the ones that have things, issues that they've got to address. They end up fixing things, even if they themselves, you know, if there's problems in an organization, rather than wait for the due process, they will just jump in and fix stuff or they will develop workarounds and end up creating this sort of rod for their own back because they're just doing all this patchwork across the organization. When in fact, what they should be doing is relaying back to the business, this is a problem, you need to fix it, versus, listen, the business will never fix it, I'm going to do it myself. So I think fundamentally there's some real issues around the way they approach their account management. But beyond that, where a lot of people go wrong is they think they have to build out the whole thing in one go. They're like, okay, let's map out the whole customer journey. Let's plot every single touch point. Let's address every single process for every single area of the whole customer experience. And it's like, you know what? You could just introduce account plans or you could just bring in a tool to help you with your documentation, your knowledge libraries, or you could just stop doing stuff that other people should be doing. And that will start the journey. That will get you, you know, some gains and some room and some breathing space to then work on the next thing that needs attention. Some things might be working really well, or at least aren't falling down. So don't focus on those now, focus on the things that are neglected or broken or not in place. So that's where I try to start. I'm like, do a gap analysis, see what's working, see what's okay, see what's broken. Let's do small little incremental iterations and then, you know, take it from there. Let me go back to that analogy because I think it's a beautiful, I think it's a brilliant analogy in the restaurant, right? So you got the server that's out front that, you know, my fries are cold, right? Yeah. Or, you know, this is, this is a terrible. And the question of does that make it back to the chef and can the chef then, uh, and even chef and then the restaurant owner, how do they react to that? Right. And I'm, mm. I find so many times in organizations and tell me if you find this with, with some of the people that you work with is sometimes that the server feels more comfortable just going and throwing that in the trash and grabbing a new one instead of saying, Hey, Hey chef, we got an issue here. Right. And so enabling that feedback loop to ensure that key account management. So the key account manager is back and, and uh, tying into the rest of the company. What are some of the things that you, I mean, systems is a big part of that. I, I see that we deal in systems every day, but how do you empower? How do you focus on empowering the account manager to make sure that they have that? They have to be, they have to have that authority and that empowerment to go back and say what's actually happening within a customer and be listened to. Well, I think you kind of <clears throat> hit on it there, that authority and empowerment, but you can't, you have to have that as an organizational alignment, right? It can't be, okay, your manager says you're aligned, you're, you're enabled and uh, autonomous and you've got the authority to go and do this. Then you go talk to your product team and they're like, I don't care. I've got other things going on. You're not part of my priorities. You can whistle versus an organization that is bought into the key account management vision understands that the key account manager represents the voice of customer, but also has to balance the needs of the business. And when they come to you with something that needs attention, it needs attention. It doesn't just get cast aside because you've got other things that you care about and you're not interested. So that's where a big challenge is, is trying to align all the moving parts of the organization. And it's as a key account manager, it's not my goal. I'm not there telling product to do stuff because I feel like it or I'm just wanting to make them dance or, you know, being difficult. <laughs> it's I'm trying to keep our customers. That's yeah. it. I'm trying to make them more profitable. I'm trying to get more business from them. So I'm not doing this for fun. But then you hit all these brick walls and obstacles, and that's where your manager, the leader of your, biz, of your key account management team, needs to be 
the advocate, the one that's talking to the other department heads and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. We need you on board. We need your help. We're here to help too. Tell us what we can do to make your life easier. And this is where we could use your your attention. So <clears throat> it's got to be an organizational-wide strategy. It can't just be a team that does its own thing and then fights a battle every time they need something done. I've used a couple of strategies in the past to try this. I'm interested in like and and to execute it. Like one, it was a combination between systems and systems and meetings and meeting cadence. Like I think I think the meeting cadence is so critically important actually to people, and you're not going to solve it all with systems. But it's essentially the system to be able to log your log the issues that are going on with a customer, understand you know when and how am I going to get feedback to that because it needs to be within 24 to 48 hours and 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 do that. But then have regular, one of the things that I, I've done in the past is just have regular listening meetings, <laughs> which is mm. like, I'm going to come in and product or product and service and account management need to just have those regular listening meetings where they're, they're shutting up and they're listening to the front lines. And because I, I think it's so valuable the frontline information that uh, camps bring, right? It's especially if they're you've invested in training them, they have strong relationships. It's just uh, I think it often gets missed. So, well, I mean, otherwise these departments are working in silos, right? I mean, it really. And I, I read not so long ago some statistic around sales and marketing, and you know you've got marketing qualified leads, which is somebody filling in a form and they think their job's done versus, you know, a sales lead, which is you know, very different. And often, in fact, I think something about marketing collateral, like basically sales, 90% of them rewrite the stuff or don't think it's fit for purpose. So marketing are merrily plodding along, punching out campaigns and email newsletters and templates and slides and sales aren't using any of it. And you think, well, there's a big disconnect between, well, what's the team that's supposed to be driving the the leads, what do they need versus what the team is that's producing the content that's supposed to support that. And I feel the same way with account management, you know, like, yeah, they're talking to the customers all day long. So are the customer support. So is, you know, other parts of the business. And you think, well, the, the people creating the products are people that are investing in the support and the services and the, the infrastructure and the resources should be paying attention to that instead of doing their own thing. And one thing that I think I often talk about is if you look at, say, enhancements, product enhancements, you might have, you know, your your product team doing new releases all the time of new features, but then there'll be bugs from two years ago that haven't been addressed. And you think, what? My client isn't looking for some of this fancy stuff. You've just developed that because you think we should or our competitor did it. But how about just fixing that bug that's been on the P1 list for two years? Why don't we start with that, you know, like, like – why are you going after the fancy shiny new thing versus, you know, fixing some of the stuff that's been bugging people for a long time? How often do you go into a how often do you go into a company and see a highly organized, you know, by account, by need being acted upon feature list that that needs to be, you know, that is being acted on. I mean, I'm I'm talking software, right? by order of importance, by order of impact to a customer and that being communicated well to the account management team. Like how often do you see that? Is that something that is a, a gap most of the time or? Uh, I don't see it very often. And when I do see it, it tends to be overkill. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had some clients where they have every tool under the sun. They have every executive wanting account managers to track every little piece of information. There's four different platforms all integrated into Salesforce with different things that they have to import. It becomes this administrative nightmare, which my view is trying to be practical. Like I, I've worked in the trenches for 20 years as an account manager. So I understand like the realities of working with a customer. I understand what, you know, there's some some key things you need to deliver, but the the way that you deliver them is quite simple, the way that you capture that information. So, yeah, I tend to see either very loose, very unstructured, left, you know, maybe some Excel templates, a few guidelines, or somewhere that's so extreme that there is so much information that it becomes unmanageable mm -hmm. and not really useful. It's there, but there's no insight, nothing you can draw from it. It's just massive amounts of information i think i see the same thing on the on the front end sales side with marketing too right you see it's it's how do you 
I love that word you use. What is actionable, right? How how do we just make? How do we boil this down? And I also loved how you, you talked about it. Sometimes you get the full map when you when all you need is a map of the next a hundred yards, right? So yeah, you you need the map, and and practicality becomes absolutely critical in that map of the next 100 yards. Now you need to you need to understand where it fits within the whole vision and the system and that type of thing, mm-hmm. but it's how do I take it from if I'm starting on the, I'm going to use a football, you know, an American football analogy, right? If I'm starting on the the 10 yard line, I need to get to the 20 yard line first before <laughs> before yeah. before scoring a touchdown, right? So it's it's interesting because it's some of the same stuff that you know we we operate in the same the same arena, right? We provide account prospecting we provide uh, tools for prospecting tools for managing pipeline and I, I think the best account growth tool I've ever seen in my life and so but what we often find is people want to over they want to put everything in and it's got to be perfect before anybody uses it when the fact that like that iteration is such a healthy part of the journey like it is mm-hmm. such a healthy part of the journey because you get to find out what works and what doesn't work. And you get to iterate quickly on it. So, and who's it for? Like that's what I often ask people. I'm like, who is this for? Why? Why are you capturing this? Like, why is this level of detail necessary? Who is who is going to ever read this? Often they can't answer the question, uh, and often when their leaders want information, they come and ask them. They don't go into the CRM or the <laughs> to to look for stuff. So I really quite challenge them on thinking. Well, what what is this for? And if you can't automate it. You know, if you can't use some API or some sort of database SQL as your connection to kind of bring stuff in, I don't think it's up to individuals to be manually updating that sort of stuff. I feel like there's, and there's a difference between data versus knowledge, you know, information yes, versus knowledge. Absolutely. And that's what you don't often find. Yeah. I think data versus knowledge and then methodology versus process is also another thing that falls into that with me. Like it, it's like how do we we can agree on how we're going to execute and then as as a framework, right? And then driving that into process. I, I I'm a big believer in that. Then driving that into process and that process should contain the data you need, right? To give you then the knowledge you need uh, coming out the other side. We could uh, spend a ton of time here. One of the things I completely forgot to ask you that I was so impressed with when we got introduced is you mind sharing your your journey with listeners because I think it's it's a really good journey relative to getting sh- really strong in account management, taking a leap of faith, and then being able to share share to the world and improve improve companies, improve communities with a little bit of guts, right? And so I I, I <laughs> loved your story. Do you mind Do you mind sharing it? Yeah, sure. I've been in account management for such a long time. Most of my career, 20, I mean, at least 20, 20 plus years emphasis on the plus. And um, I just was in the same industry for all those years in business travel. And I was just really struggling to kind of move beyond that. You know, I kind of thought, well, how do I get a promotion? How do I move into a different industry? How do I get people to see that I'm an expert in key account management? I kept being told in my company where I was at at the time, so 2017, oh, you need to be more visible. You need to do this. I'm like, well, I don't know what more I could do. I'm doing a good job. I've kept on my clients. Like, what? So I read a couple of books on personal branding. Branding Pays by Karen Kang and Career Cred by Ryan Roten. That was a two pivotal books in my my journey, which got me thinking, you know, I need, I, I need to do more. I need to do more to let people know I know what I'm doing, that I'm good at key account management and that my skills are transferable. So I started writing uh, a blog, writing some articles. Then I started on social media. LinkedIn. Then I started on Twitter. Then I started on YouTube and just gradually started to talk about the things that I like to talk about from my background. Made a distinct, committed decision to only talk about the profession. Didn't want to talk about the industry, didn't talk about my clients, really spoke to like the profession of key account management. Also, I didn't want conflict. You know, when if I'm working for somebody, I didn't want to potentially have them go, what are you? I mean, people were kind of annoyed, some people anyway just because my profile started to raise. Um, anyway, a couple of years later, um, I was in a job I didn't really enjoy, and I just thought, you know what, and this is 2019 now, uh, people had been reaching out to me for many, many, many years, well, not many years, but in those two years, to say, do you do training? Do you do coaching? Can you help me? I'm like, well, no, I really work full time. This is just a hobby. So I pulled the pin, quit my job, decided to go 
into coaching, training, whatever. Didn't really have a plan, but I did have some savings. And I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? I'll get another job. Of course, the worst happened, the pandemic. So getting another job wasn't an option, <laughs> especially in travel, which was probably one of the, the, the biggest impacted industries. So I had to make it work. So I launched a membership learning community called the Cam Club, did, did some training, did more blogging, leaned into YouTube a bit more, and things started to fall into place. And, um, you know, over the last two years, two, uh, two to three years, it's I've got clearer on what I what my value proposition is, what I want to do. Yeah, it's been an exciting you know, roller coaster couple of years for sure. But it's just I haven't had I never thought I'm going into business for myself and I've got a plan. I was I mean I had a plan in an idea rather rather than a plan. But I just thought, you know what, let me take more control over what I want to do. I know I have things that I can offer people and let me just hone that message. And um yeah, it's led to where I am today, talking to you. That's awesome. And one of the times we were talking, one of the things you said uh, when we were talking before that really struck me in this story was, was it, it's, it is what I have to offer. It's, it's what you said. I, I, you recognize you do have a lot to offer. And then you recognize that there was an industry to serve, like truly serve and to truly help people mm. in key account management and you know, because if you get this right, they retain customers. If you get this right, they build, you know, community more effectively. Yeah. If you get this right, you're impacting families. And that really struck me when you said that, because it's like, you know what? I love, uh, I love passion. I love focus. I love diving in and just making stuff happen. And listeners, Orwick has a ton, uh, a ton to to bring to the table in terms of key account management, and uh, we're we're truly excited that he's he's one of our partners at at Membrane here, and continuing on this journey. So, so how do people get in touch with you, Warwick, uh, if they want to learn a little bit more about key account management, about how we work together at Membrane, and you with key account management? How would you recommend they get in touch? Yeah, I mean. Um... Just, just to sort of cap off that conversation real quick around what you said oh, yeah, about yeah. passion. Definitely, you know, key cap management is an underserved niche and it's something I am passionate about, but I didn't start a business based on my passion. I just knew that there were people that needed to help and support and that I had some wisdom that I could share. And yeah, you, you don't do it for the money. Definitely not. It's not part of the, you want to be compensated, but it's not about riches. You know, it's it's about mm-hmm. definitely helping people get better results and, and and supporting them in a space where I feel like they don't get it as much as they should. So yeah, in getting in touch with me, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, Warwick A. Brown, or in fact, everywhere on social on Warwick A. Brown. And uh, you can find me on YouTube, Account Manager Tips, uh, or just Account Manager Tips. I've got a podcast, The Cam Club. I'm kind of I'm kind of where, where you search Warwick Brown on Google, you'll find me. I'm uh, you know I'm kind of. Uh, I'm kind of around. So yeah, you can't miss account manager dot tips is the website. That's the website. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll put that all, everything will be in the the link. So I'll be in the description here, but, uh, and I, I love this time. You uh, able to come back and talk with us in uh, six, six, 10 months. Tell us where you are with your business and what you're seeing in terms of the market. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, just to sort of plug uh, membrane in the account growth uh, modules, which I'm kind of working on right now, uh, I made a committed decision this month to just go all in on membrane. I just thought, you know what, I've been having bits and pieces all over the place. My needs in terms of CRM are quite quite basic, being a one-man business. So, uh, but the account growth model, the processes, the systems, um, that whole stuff I'm really involved in right now. So yeah, I think a conversation in sort of the six months would be interesting to see sort of how I've developed using my business, part, using the account growth uh, modules in Membrane. Might be a little good case study to follow up on. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Let's make it happen. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, have an absolutely amazing day. Keep shining bright and we'll talk with you soon. Bye. Bye.